Welcome. Uh, this is Peter Bergen uh, of New America. Uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, a New America fellow, uh, Alexandra Stark, who's a fellow in the Future Security Program. She's also an associate policy researcher at Brand, PhD from Georgetown. This is her new book, The Yemen Model, uh, which is published by Yale, uh, with the subtitle, Why U.S. Policy Has Failed in the Middle East. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stark uh, to uh, give us some table setting um, uh, kind of ideas about our book. And if you have questions, uh, I'll be taking them from the Slido app that you can see on your screen, uh, talk, talking to the audience here. So I'm turning it over now to Dr. Stark. Thanks so much uh, for hosting me, Peter. It's really a pleasure to be back uh, among New America colleagues, even if, if virtually, um, I miss you guys. Uh, and, and thanks to, to the events team and, and the future security team, I know um, that organizing events takes a lot of behind the scenes work and logistics, so I really appreciate um, everything that, that you guys do. Um, so yeah, my book, The Yemen Model, opens with a story of an airstrike on a bus uh, full of kids in Yemen in 2018. And that ended up killing at least uh, 20, but probably 30 or even 40 children and injuring dozens more. Um, and an investigation by CNN and some Yemeni uh, human rights groups found that an American bomb manufactured by Lockheed Martin had struck the bus. Um, for me, this is this attack is a window into um, what really intrigued and puzzled me about US involvement in the war in Yemen. Um, and that made me really want to dig deeper into this uh, and, and to study it more. So President Obama had um, kind of famously come into uh, office in, in 2008 saying that the U.S. needed to be less involved in the wars in, in, in Middle East that he called dumb wars. Um, and I don't think that's just a platitude. I think I think he and his administration really uh, believed that. So it was it was really difficult to understand or to explain then why did his administration end up backing the Saudi led coalition when it when it intervened in Yemen um, against the Houthis in March 2015. And the answer is important, I think, first, because it can help us understand how the U.S. gets pulled into conflicts and crises in the Middle East that aren't um, necessarily in its interests, um, but also hopefully a, a roadmap for how we might, uh, you know, think about preventing that from, from happening in, in the future. Um, but, but the answer to, to that puzzle, as I sketch out in the book, is that um, not just the Obama administration, but but pretty much every U.S. administration has not made policy towards Yemen uh, for Yemen's sake, but it has always been about other things. So during the Cold War, it was about balancing against the Soviet Union. In the uh, post-Cold War period, it was about um, preventing terrorism, uh, about fighting uh, al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP. Um, and then and during the, the war that really started in late 2014, um, it was about supporting U.S. security partners and balancing against Iran. So the decision that the Obama administration made in 2015 about whether, whether or not to back that Saudi-led intervention in Yemen was not based on um, you know, whether the intervention might succeed or, or whether it might help to bring stability to the region, it was about uh, backing the U.S. relationship with uh, Gulf partners, which U.S. officials believed had, um, you know, frayed or, or, or declined due to the dynamics of the Arab Spring and also uh, negotiating the Iran nuclear deal, the PPOA. Um, and so they thought that in this case, backing their Gulf partners was necessary to repair the relationship. Um, they also thought that by staying involved, they could have some leverage over the conduct of, of the intervention, although I think that was somewhat dubious even at the time. Um, two U.S. administration officials later wrote in, in an article in, in Foreign Affairs um, where they likened this decision to get, quote, getting into a, a car with a drunk driver. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, now, of course, we, we know what happened as a result of that decision, uh, the war led to the largest humanitarian crisis in the world at the time, including widespread famine and displacement. Uh, according to Oxfam, more than 20 million people, or about 70% of the population uh, of the, the 
country needs humanitarian protection and assistance. There are over 2 million children who suffer from acute malnutrition. Um, so, so there have been these humanitarian consequences. Um, but also, I think quite notably, this intervention also hasn't achieved U.S. security goals in the region either. And in fact, I would argue has worked uh, against them. Um, we can we can talk about the Houthis in the Red Sea later if, if it comes up in Q and A, but we can see that even even now with um, the Houthis increasing importance in regional security, uh, and also the re the recent resurgence in um, AQP AQAP activity in, in southern Yemen in recent years. Um, so for me, the term the Yemen model really uh, encapsulates the U.S. approach to Yemen as this uh, thing about being about other security parties rather than about Yemen itself. So what is the Yemen model? Um, it's a term that Obama administration used through 2014 to describe U.S. counterterrorism efforts in Yemen that they saw actually as a positive example that could also be deployed elsewhere, uh, notably in the fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Um, Yemen model, uh, involved avoiding putting conventional U.S. military boots on the ground by instead partnering with local governments. Um, in this government of the, the corrupt autocrat, President Ali Abdullah Saleh, and later uh, President Hadi, who had been his vice president and replaced him in an uncontested election from the Arab Spring. So the U.S. would work uh, by, with, and through these governments bring you know, support and training, um, sometimes drone strikes or airstrikes. Uh, the problem uh, in retrospect, of course, that this narrow aperture, this, this narrow lens on counterterrorism didn't allow US officials to see what was actually happening in, in Yemen on the ground um, as the post-Arab spring gold transition, uh, which had started up on a pretty strong note ultimately uh, floundered, and, and as the U.S. partner, President Hadi, um, failed to, to govern effectively or to map out a future for uh, Yemen's political institutions. Um, another thing that I was really struck by around 2017 and 18 was the advocacy coalition that was organizing to lobby Congress to change the U.S. approach to Yemen. And, and this a broad and, and frankly, I think a fascinating coalition that encompasses, you know, any, everyone from Senator Bernie Sanders to Senator Mike Lee, for example, an interesting partnership there. Um, and, and this group was able to identify the specific sources of U.S. leverage over regional partners, and then to identify specific types of legislation that could move through Congress uh, in, in a special expedited manner. Uh, that was related to war powers and also to U.S. arms sales. And I found, um, you know, I found as I've talked about it that uh, a lot of people think that, you know, because those bills, they, they passed Congress, but then they were vetoed by President Trump. So maybe that whole effort didn't really matter all that much. Um, and what I tried to do in the chapter of the book is to map out precisely how I saw what this advocacy coalition was able to achieve as really significant in shifting U.S. policy. Um, now, obviously, that doesn't mean U.S. policy is perfect now, but it did shift the domestic politics of the Yemen debate substantially enough that the Biden administration came into office pushing for diplomacy to end war in Yemen. Um, that, in turn, led to a U.N.-negotiated truce in April 2022, which um, is also imperfect and messy, certainly, but also um, led to fighting being put on hold for, for the most part uh, and a substantial decline in casualties due to violence and also created at least a little bit of base to begin an inter-Yemeni dialogue about maybe what the future of the country uh, could look like. Um, so this is all, uh, of course, again, it's deeply imperfect and, and messy, but the the points that I want to make is that, um, we'll see often is, it's especially when it comes to ending longstanding, complex, intractable conflicts. But, um, you know, diplomacy is tough, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's failed. So, I mean, we can imagine, for example, a counterfactual situation in which Yemen had still been involved in an ongoing, you know, failed conflict when when the war started, for example. I think that would have looked 
substantially different. Um, but I, I think this movement is also important because foreign policy and national security are, are issues that can feel very um, remote and kind of far away for people and, and, and people can feel like they don't have much leverage or they don't really have a way in the conversation. And, and here we can see a case where this kind of advocacy and organizing really did, I think, make a substantial difference and I think can serve as an interesting case study for thinking about um, how movements can affect U.S. foreign policy, uh, especially via the levers that Congress has. Um, and, and I think that's also something that might resonate, resonate in, in today's context where, um, you know, at least to me, it feels like more and more people are starting to try to weigh in on the direction that U.S. policy should take and kind of finding their voice. Um, yeah, so just to, just to return to the Yemen model for a second, um, I, I think the Yemen model means that U.S. policy, both towards Yemen and also in the Middle East more broadly, um, prioritizes short-term stability and, and policy wins at the expense of addressing the root causes of, of conflict and crises. Um, and this means that those conflicts and crises are more likely to recur again um, in a way that ultimately undermines US the U.S. policy approach to Yemen and, and also critically, I think, fails to accomplish U.S. strategic objectives. So um, Yemen, U.S. support for the Saudi coalition didn't do much to limit Iranian influence. In, in fact, instead, over the course of the war, what we've seen is a growing partnership uh, between the Houthis and Iran, support from Iran. The Houthis have gained the ability to launch uh, missiles and, and drones at targets across borders, which of course is a phenomenon we're now seeing playing out in the Red Sea uh, at the detriment of international trade. Um, and, and at the same time, like, like proxy wars often tend to do, the conflict has become more complex over time as external intervention and the conflict itself have driven nationalization and have entrenched war interests. Um, so yeah, so what to do about all of that? Um, in, in the concluding chapter of the book, I talk about trying to reimagine U.S. policy in a way that takes a long -term view and that seeks to address the root causes of crises rather than just treating the, the symptoms of the crises as they erupt. And um, in Yemen, a failure to address the underlying causes of the conflict, uh, which there are a number, but they include regional grievances, corruption, uh, transitional justice, amongst other things, um, that has kind of generated this succession of, of crises that build on one another. Um, you know, from the U.S. counterterrorism campaign all the way through the post-Arab Spring transition and, and through the war. So. Um, the U.S. approach, this could look like uh, prioritizing long-term stability, uh, and in particular, stability or security, per se. Um, it would see the U.S. using its leverage with partners uh, in the region where it's able to, to push parties to end conflicts. It would include support for uh, genuinely inclusive peace process. Uh, and political transitions and make um, accountability, positional justice uh, a, a, a part of post-conflict transitions. Um, it would highlight investing in sustainable diplomacy and development as go-to kind of first off-the-shelf solutions um, rather than prioritizing military solutions. Um, and I think all of this, this new approach to foreign policy, it, it could be messy certainly in the short term. And I think many people will see it as as perhaps idealist, idealistic or, or maybe naive, but um, certainly I think it will require more hands-on involvement from, from the international community, um, but also an acknowledgement from the US and international community that can't uh, unilaterally impose solutions. But in the longer term though, I think this kind of approach could yield uh, more sustainable post-conflict peace and more uh, stable and prosperous societies. So um, with that, that that is kind of all of my feelings about the book. Mm -hmm. And Peter, I'm really looking forward to our discussion. And I also wanted to say I uh, really appreciated your your blurb for the book. So <laughs> thanks for, for reading and for hosting me. Well, thank you. Um, so picking up, I mean, I guess 
your subtitle why the u.s policy has failed in the middle east i i think that's inarguable in yemen and i wanted to get into that in a little more detail because but i mean when you look at say iraq u.s support for the iraqi counterterrorism service which was with very few american boots on the ground that did, did lead to the defeat of isis um so i i i think in it obviously it that model of working but with and by and through other forces can you know it can work or it cannot work and obviously you know in yemen there have been different phases but i wanted to talk about the the phase that involved the houthis or who are um because it seems to me as far as i can understand first of all the houthis you know they their type of shiism is is widely regarded as heretical in much of the islamic world including by their iranian sponsors i mean so from a religious point of view um, they're not really allied to Iran uh, with their kind of, I think, five verse Shiism as opposed to 12 verse Shiism. Um, I think when the war began against the central government, um, the civil war, you know, the, the Houthis were like this ragtag militia with really no real connections to Iran. And now they're almost like Hezbollah, I think, in terms of because you can't, you can't make an anti ship ballistic missile in your basement in Yemen. I mean, you're getting it from somewhere. So it seems to me when the Saudis invaded in 2015 for their own national security, you know, it's, they felt that, you know, it was like having a, you know, a jihadist group that was taking over Mexico or something. I'm not using it's not an exact analog, but you know, clearly the Saudis have interests in Yemen, uh, but they intervened in a way that I think was massively, massively self-defeating because a it killed so many civilians. B it instead of achieving its 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 goal of separating the houthis from the iranians they brought them closer together so and of course the united states was sort of sanctioning this and even supporting some of this for some of the time of the war so do you think that the saudi intervention produced exactly the outcome the saudis did not want yeah absolutely i see um the, the you know the yemen refers um in, in its original context refers specifically to the counterterrorism campaign uh, and kind of support for for partners, but I really see it as uh, an idea that carries through the ongoing war, which is um, you know more of a narrow focus on on these particular kind of abstract U.S. security interests, which are um, you know maybe important, but it, it's an overwhelming focus on those as opposed to um, you know what's actually happening on the ground in Yemen. What might um, you know, lead to stability in Yemen, what, what, and the conflict, um, what's the best way to achieve, you know, for Saudi Arabia to achieve stability and, and security on its, on its Southern border. And of course, um, the US and I have think, an, go ahead. yeah, the U S doesn't have an embassy. No, I, no not, not. A, so, so our, the United States ability to actually influence what's going on is, is more limited than would be if we had a diplomatic presence there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, now a lot of, uh, so, so there's been an investment in, in diplomacy in Yemen, at least in the past few years, and, and we're set aside the present moment for a second. Um, the U.S. has supported the U.S. negotiated process, and there's um, a U.S. special envoy for Yemen who has been you know, traveling all over the reason, uh, region. It sounds like a tireless and kind of thankless job, uh, so I appreciate him doing it um engaged in in that process which has been uh, uh at least marginally fruitful it led to a, a truce a reduction in violence um there is a, a a supposed roadmap where the parties have have kind of you know laid out where they stand where they need to to go to reach some kind of uh, agreement and, and ultimately move towards some kind of longer term political negotiation process so um, there, there, that's one of, I think the important ways that the U S has, um, engaged and then, and prior to that, well, even through the present, um, I think the U S relationship, with it's a regional partner, also a really important source of leverage where, you know, there are a series of decision points where you can either, um, you know, try to provide more support to the intervention or try to use that as leverage to affect the behavior of, uh, partners and, and try to get them to end conflicts rather than and engage in them. And 
um, I, I talk about in the book about how that shifts a little bit over over time and over administrations kind of grapple with this question of um, what to do about civilian casualties, to what extent can the U.S. engage to try to, to, to reduce civilian casualties? Is there a way to, to you know, provide training and, and provide resources on that front that would actually help the problem or not? Um, but yeah, I think via those, those regional partners is another kind of key point where um, best can em- engage diplomatically around, around Yemen in particular and, and conflicts in the more broadly. Well, I take away from your comments that the UN negotiated ceasefire or truce that's sort of an ongoing process has really damped down the war, which is a good thing. Yeah, yeah, it at least, um, again, you know, prior to uh, October 7th, there was a truce agreed in, I think, April 2022. So it, it lasted de facto for um, some time and led to a substantial reduction in violence, which um, it, it wasn't even a sire, so it wasn't really a permanent solution for ending the conflict. It didn't address a lot of the, um, you know, political issues and the, the others that you'd have to sort through to, to kind of move towards a more um, sustainable negotiating process and a more sustainable solution for the conflict. But I, I think it did offer some useful um, steps and is the kind of thing that we'd want to just kind of start and, and continue offering support uh, and investing in uh, try to end the conflict. And this truce process was preceded by the United Arab Emirates sort of withdrawing its troops and then Kingdom of Saudi Arabia also sort of saying, well, after eight years of conflict, we haven't really, I mean, uh, you know, what was the sequence here about how this all came about? Because it seems that the UAE sort of said, this does seem to be a non-winnable situation or we've achieved whatever goals we wanted to achieve. And they got out f- uh, first. And then the Saudis, I think, also sort of said, well, this is not really getting us what we want either. And they pulled out. Um, so what? How, how does that, by, their, by them pulling out, did that kind of, in a sense, lower the conflict anyway so that the conditions were ripe for the ceasefire? Or what was the sequence? Yeah, I think that that's a good point that that conditions were ripe, riper for for a ceasefire that over time the UAE and Saudi Arabia had uh, and others of the co that was intervening had um, come to recognize that there wasn't really going to be a military solution to the conflict that they weren't going to be able to um, you know simply defeat the Houthis in in short order and kind of restore security on their uh, for Saudi Arabia on their southern border. Um, so, so that was certainly part of, uh, the calculation there. Do you think, uh, I mean, obviously the Houthis are taking the, you know, continue to shoot at warships and, and commercial shipping in the Red Sea, which obviously the number of targets has gone down considerably since most commercial ships are no longer taking that route. Now the Houthis were able to sustain, you know, they, I don't think they're that deterrable in the sense that they fought against the Saudis had a pretty large air campaign, many, many thousands of airstrikes, which killed many, you know, I think I, I think if 30,000 people were killed in these airstrikes by the Saudis, many of them civilians. So are the, you know, obviously US airstrikes against Houthi targets or UK airstrikes against Houthi targets are likely to be more targeted than the Saudis, who seem to have a pretty non-targeted approach to this. But, you know, are they going to be deterred? Uh, They don't, and they do seem to be continuing the campaign against shipping in the Red Sea. Uh, It's hard for me to judge if, you know, CENTCOM releases um, data on this pretty regularly, almost every day, but it's hard for me to judge, you know, how deterred they've been. Do you think they've been deterred? Do you think they are deterrable? Yeah, this this is, I think, a really important question, and I might a longer answer to it, but I promise I'll, I'll wind mm-hmm. around to um, your question. So I think I think you're right to point to, um, or, or what I've seen really, it, it's, it's like U.S. Uh, goals since the the campaign specifically against the Houthis um, started in, in January of this year in order um, to discourage their attacks on, on vessels in the Red Sea. On commercial vessels, um, so it, it it seems like it has a few different logics to it. So, 
um, at least at the beginning, there was more of an emphasis on uh, the idea of, of deterrence by um, punishment, that a U.S. response would prevent future Houthi attacks, um, would, would deter them, would stop them from, from those attacks. Um, and I think, you know, as you said, since they have continued, they have continued pretty consistently, they've declined uh, numerically uh, uh, slightly over the past couple of months, but not substantially. Um, so I think we can kind of, like you said, conclude that that, that logic has been particularly successful of, of deterrence by punishment. Um, more recently, officials have talked to more in terms of a logic of uh, deterrence by denial, so trying to erode the Houthis' ability to launch um, future attacks. They've been, the, the U.S. And, and the coalition that it's part of has been um, intercepting um, missiles and drones. It's been um, shoot, attacking them before they're fired or although as they're on the launch pad. Um, has been targeting occasionally the U.S. and the U.K. have targeted, um, uh, and, and you're right, they have been specifically uh, much more targeted, I think, than the the Saudi-led coalitions airstrip, but had been targeted specifically at targets that were related to, you know, what the Houthis were doing in the Red Sea um, to try to erode their capability, like their ability to do that. Um, and but I think it's it's worth. So I, I think that uh, has arguably been more successful, at least in, in term and U.S. officials, um, you know, from what I've seen in public reporting, it's uh, hard to assess, you know, for sure, but they, they have said that they they believe that this is having some effect on um, eroding these capabilities. Um, but I, I think one concern is that we also need to, um, you know, as the Yemen model Kind of thinking would would suggest that we also need to to pay attention to the broader context of the conflict, to you know understand the ongoing war in Yemen and what what the Houthis are trying to achieve in particular, and also how that's linked to the conflict in Gaza. I think without that, um, we're kind of, kind of taking the short term view and not really um, taking a longer term view about what the Houthis are trying to achieve because I think from their perspective you know keeping up with their their news sites and reading their proclamations i think they're doing a really interesting campaign that's um designed to communicate to to yemenis and really to the middle east region you know what the houthis are all about to get them legitimacy at home and across the region, um to support the palestinian cause which is really quite popular and and it's um, both popular to say to say that they're you know uh, they're the one of the few who are willing to take action to support the Palestinians, and also difficult for the opposition to kind of frame an argument against the Houthis. Um, and so I, I would argue that their um, this information campaign has been quite successful so far. Um, it's kind of into mismatch uh, or maybe a misunderstanding between what the U.S. is trying to achieve with these strikes to erode Houthi abilities. And what the Houthis are are trying to achieve which is, I think, more closely related to um, you know shaping their image, bolstering their legitimacy at home, uh, that kind of. Thing. If there was a ceasefire in Gaza, do you think they would stop their attacks on commercial shipping in the Red Sea, which, by the way, twelve percent or fifteen up between twelve to fifteen percent of red of global trade goes through that route? Obviously, that's not true right now, but it's a not insignificant kind of drag on the global economy. So you know, would a ceasefire change that calculus? Yeah, I think that's a really important um, and kind of difficult question to answer. I think the Houthis have certainly framed what they're doing around the conflict in Gaza and have, have been very consistent and specific in, the, in their message, how they talk about this, that the strikes are aimed at um, getting de-escalation or ceasefire in Gaza and getting uh, humanitarian aid in, and they've said they'll continue this um, until they they meet those goals. So, I think the 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 justification, the the reason for for them to do this and and to gain so much legitimacy and popularity has to do with conflict. And so, if we're um, hopefully to see a, you know a ceasefire or some time kind of end to the conflict in Gaza um I don't think that means I, I'm not sure that we can take the Houthis at their word and that they'll never 
again, attack vessels in, in the Red Sea. I think they've discovered that this is a really useful source of leverage for them. Um, and, and indeed, they not not to this level or at this kind of pace, but you know, even before October 7th, they had occasionally attacked um, vessels in, in various ways in the Red Sea. So I don't think, I mean, it's hard to imagine them, them stopping altogether, but the fact that the notification would be taken away, I think is important. Um, I think it would certainly change uh, at least their calculus. But they, and their calculus does change. So, for instance, you know, you, you remember well, Alexandra, that they were taking, um, you know, pretty accurate shots at very key parts of the Saudi oil, uh, you know, Abakake and other key Saudi oil facilities. And also they also took a shot at Abu Dhabi's, um, you know, airport, uh, showing, you know, an ability to reach out a pretty long way from that base and, uh, and also to shoot pretty accurately. So those strikes have stopped now that I guess, and that must be related to the ceasefire that we discussed earlier, right? Yeah, I wanted to say that I forgot, I wanted to say this earlier in response to your question about um, the, the Saudi and Emirati calculus around the intervention and how that, that changed over time. I think part of that was also, um, you know, first the calculation that, that the conflict couldn't necessarily be won militarily, but also that the Houthis had gained the ability um, through their partnership with Iran to target um, territory in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates um, pretty directly. And that even if they weren't able to cause uh, substantial damage, that could be really troubling from an economic perspective, where there was one strike that um, occurred near a Formula One race and that that kind of threw the whole event into question and the drivers were kind of being like, hey, are we in, in here? And so um, I think speaks to what Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are trying to achieve in, in terms of, um, you know, in economic terms, um, that that was really counter to that. And of course, in security terms as well. Um, so that I think really changed their calculus. And now, can you remind me of the second part of your question? Because no, I've um, forgotten already. Uh, I think that was that, that was really the question, which is like once they demonstrate an ability to, um, but I mean, meaning that they're not irrational actors in the sense that they they once the Saudis and the Emiratis withdrew from the war, those attacks on critical Saudi infrastructure and in, and Emirati infrastructure stopped. Right. So the point is, I'm just saying they are it's not like they're they are deterrable in the sense that if their goals are achieved, uh, they will stop doing the things that most people find objectionable. It seems uh, it's not that they're just complete religious fanatics. I mean, their, their slogan, as you know, is death to America and death to Israel. Um, they have taken some shots at Israel, uh, not very successfully. Uh, clearly, they have the capacity to do it. It's interesting that they're not really doing it directly uh that you know they mm. they they can reach the port of Eliat in southern israel fairly easily i think early in the war they took a they took a strike there but they haven't done it since which is interesting yeah i think i think you're right and i i agree that that de-escalation so yes first of all you're right that it, it there had been um even in the lead up to the truce uh, an escalation in the, the cross-border attacks and and uh, the coalition uh, via its partners on the ground kind of upping um, its pressure against the Houthis and then vice versa. So that escalation was really, yeah, was cut off by Alexandra, I think you just froze. Alexandra, can you hear me? Alexandra, you're, you're, you're frozen. Well, maybe he's rational calculations not yeah of course they're i think it's important to say that they're repressive they are violent that they have treated their own people violently oh i think i froze for a second you, you did am i back yeah you are. <laughs> i mean if you um one thing is um if it, if it happens again you know maybe we just it, there may be a signal issue on your end so maybe just we can just do it without the video yeah. but it's fine um let me ask you also um, I mean, the, the book is called The Yemen Model, and it really goes back to, back to counterterrorism. And how would you assess Al Qaeda has sort of waxed and waned in Yemen over the years? At some point, you know, they control large amounts of territory um, in, you know, sort of in Hadramaut and in the uh, sort of towards the Omani side of the, of the country. Uh, that seems to have 
ended. But you said in your opening remarks that there's sort of Al Qaeda presence in southern Yemen. And so how would you assess um, their strength or lack thereof today? Yeah, that's difficult to say for for sure. And I always um, make sure to read the work of folks like Elizabeth Kendall, who um, do really important work on on AQAP in Yemen um, and understanding their presence there. But I, what I have seen, at least um, in recent months and years, is an increase, um, or it seems like an increase in in the number of kind of AQAP attributable attributable um attacks that have mostly really been aimed at the um the government the internationally recognized government of Yemen and and in particular the Southern Transition Council which without going into to too much detail is part of that internationally recognized government but also wants to succeed from Yemen so kind of has an has agenda is um closely aligned with is is secular uh, for the large part in its orientation. So I I see it more as um, kind of involved in the fighting amongst factions, not on the the axis of Houthis versus kind of the anti Houthi coalition, but uh, you know another axis of of uh, fighting, not necessarily as uh, international you know internationally aimed attacks. Although I, I I'm not sure I'm you know, have have enough information to kind of assess their their capability to do that. But it is well, interesting kind of that trend. raises a, a, a good point, which is you know, so Yemen is the poorest country in the Arabian Peninsula. It's running out of water. President Saleh, the longtime president uh, Yemeni dictator, famously said that ruling Yemen was like dancing on the head of snakes. Mm -hmm. uh, Yemen is the second most heavily armed per capita country in the world, other than the United States, which is number one. So, you know, weaponry is and, and you know, sort of tribal rivalries, heavily armed uh, locals, kind of low level conflict is just part of the Yemen story, as far as I can tell. I mean, kidnapping. And so, you know, I, mean, I actually went to Yemen after the October, the coal attack. And I remember that there was a dispute between two tri tribes that was being settled with artillery. You know, it wasn't being settled with. <laughs> and that's long before the, the the big civil war that we're talking about. So. You know, it's not an easy place to govern um, and to and, and what you just described about Al Qaeda, it shows you how complicated the picture is on the ground. But so related to that, I wanted to turn to an audience question from Ross Silvestri, who says, how can the U.S. avoid tunnel vision in Yemen getting too close to regional partners interests, whether counterterrorism, Iran and prioritize U.S. interests? Um, yeah, I'm not sure I got the whole question, but it was how can the U.S. avoid? Well, I mean, sort of clientitis, or, I guess. Right? Really sort of, yeah, I mean, how can how does the U.S. prioritize its real interests as opposed to just sort of acquiescing to, say, Saudi Arabia's interests? Yeah. So for me, this this goes back to um, at least being open to looking at be best for Yemen itself in terms of you know, stability, economic prosperity, um, but but trying to look at Yemen through the lens of Yemen, if if that makes sense, rather than through the lens of um, you know what what do you think how will Iran react, um, you know those those other other facets, and because I think by responding in in the short term to those kinds of crises as they pop up and um not digging into kind of what are the root causes of, of of conflicts and issues that are ongoing in Yemen and that you know are many of them are are kind of tied together across time so you see you know issues that arose even before the Arab Spring protests that then really carried through the pro um the Arab Spring the post Arab Spring transition process which um people had a lot of hope for at one was seen as very inclusive, you know, trying to to really gather di different segments of Yemeni society to try to negotiate um, what the future of the country could look like. But then that kind of fell apart for for reasons that are rooted in that that history. And then on through the the war, the Houthis, um, you know, taking over the capital and all all of that. So um, get all of that kind of long thing is to say that. If we never get at those underlying kind of 
causes of fundamentally, you know, who has access to uh, governance, access to the resources of the state, how are those um, governance look like? How can it be fair? How to address the the different kind of grievances and concerns of um, all actors um, regionalized and within Yemen to, to different regions. Um, as long as we aren't addressing those, I think that the conflicts, um, maybe not this particular con conflicts and crises will continue and that those in will affect U.S. interests, will affect stability, will um, you know, make international intervention more, like, more likely to draw in other actors, uh, ability, all of the things that are ultimately not in U.S. interests. So I think trying to really focus on longer term um, root causes and, and helping Yemenis, finding ways to support Yemenis to address those as because, uh, I mean, what we've also seen historically is that uh, it doesn't work for the or the international community, the UN, whomever, to impose solutions on on conflicts. Right? We it, it's the actors can be really helpful. They can play a really critical supporting role in in a variety of ways, but um, they need to ultimately be um, you know including and elevating Yemeni voices and 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 engaging in a Yemeni an inter intra inter Yemeni dialogue. <laughs> Um, to try to map out, you know, for for Yemeni folks themselves, what all those questions that I mentioned, you know, access to the state governance resources, that kind of thing. It wasn't so long ago that Yemen was two countries, as you know, and effectively it's become two countries again. With and I'm just this is kind of a question, not a statement. So it seems to me the Houthis have won the war. They control the most of the populations in the north, which they control. They control the capital and they control the largest port in the country, and. Um, you know, obviously, this is not a solution that everybody, I mean, you know, when you come to a peace agreement, neither side is going to be completely satisfied unless the other side is completely defeated the other side. There's a, a mutual recognition of a mutually, mutually hurting stalemate and sort of decision, people sort of wise up and say, well, you know, we're kind of getting nowhere. Let's, you know, so would one, I guess, you know, would one possibility be redividing the country up again into two countries? Would another possibility be some like totally federated, you know, very independent South from the North or what are the political solutions that actually could work? Yeah, I mean, it is um, it, interesting to reflect. Uh, I talk about this in, a bit in the book too, in I think the first or second chapter that um, Yemen was, it, not only was it two from the 60s, 70s uh, through 1990, when Yemen became a unified state, and, and you know, subsequently again was in fact uh, affected by internal conflict. So it really wasn't like a, a country called Yemen for for all that long. Um, but also, you know, prior to that, historically, there's a, a kind of a long trajectory of, of um, different political polities uh, in North and South Yemen and other parts of the country as well. Um, so that so the idea of, of a united is, is one that people have had you know in their minds for a long time that people have, have spoken about um, there's been an aspiration for but uh, in practice there has not existed a, a unified state of Yemen for all that long. Um, so all that all that is to to agree with you and to say I think yeah I think in in practice there will have to be some sort of rated solution I think the de facto situation on the ground means that's the case. I think the parties have largely recognized that. And it's really the the negotiations are working on now are really about these very key, but very specific questions about, you know, who is going to pay um, civil, uh, civil salaries in, in the Houthi occupied part of Yemen versus the, the uh, South of Yemen, um, you know, gets government revenues how do they those kinds of questions so it's not so much it would be a, a really a centralized unified state it's more like how what will this kind of de facto federated system look like but um yeah i think even even looking back at the the national dialogue conference which was the um post kind of term 
process. The, 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 those solutions were never ultimately implemented, but one of the came out of that was around uh, a federal state and what that could look like. And then ultimately a lot of parties kind of objected to the specific allocation of how how the federal state had was suggested to be divided up. And so that was an issue. But I think there's been kind of an idea for some time now that there, if not too, um, you know, uh, in, legally two states, then at least some kind of federal decentralized system that allows um, for, for different kinds of government governance in different parts of the country. Hey, another um, audience question. If you have any questions for Dr. Stark, put them in Slido. Um, you talked about the Houthi response to Gaza. Do you think the Yemen model of U.S. policy is playing out with regards to U.S. policy towards Gaza itself right now from anonymous? Yeah, uh, that's a tough question. And I, I will say at the outset that I'm not a scholar of the um, uh, Palestine-Israel conflict, and, and I know that conflict has its own complications and and um, so it, this is more kind of my personal like re reflection on on what's going on than kind of a really um, systematic approach, right? But I do I see similarities in the sense that it seems that much of the discussion around Gaza is um, not as much about how do we find kind of a solution, a long-term solution for that conflict for the people who live there and more about, well, we need to support our partners and allies and what, how would this share, um, you know, relationships with them. And I've seen some similarities, similarities in terms of, um, domestic political discussion around what kinds of leverage might the U.S. have over its partners and how, how could it use that leverage? Would that be effective? Um, so, so I think there are, there are some substantial similarities there, certainly, and it's an interesting thought exercise. Well, there are, I mean, here, two, here are sort of two similarities in, in questions. So the Saudis obviously killed a lot of Yemeni civilians. Um, the U.S. tried to put pressure on them to not do that, I think, with very limited success. Um, the same is playing out in Gaza, it seems to me, uh, just uh, as a sort of... Um, at the same time, you know, the Saudis were killing a lot of Yemenis, civilians. There was, I think, virtually no reaction in the Arab world about that. And yet, you know, the Israelis have killed... 34,000 Palestinian civilians, according, uh, not civilians, those include militants, according to the Gaza Health Ministry, which is controlled by Hamas, obviously. But, and I, I don't think any be seriously debates that these figures are more in the more or less in the ballpark. And we've seen, you know, not only protests around the Arab world, but also obviously in the United States. So, not to put you on the spot, <laughs> I guess it's a tricky one. But, you know, the Saudis kind of got a free pass in the Arab world, I think, on the Yemeni civilian issue. Not so much in the United States, but, uh, you know, any kind of, has it any re reasons to think why that was the case? Yeah, well, first going back to, I wanted to go back to the point you made about um, U.S. leverage in, in, the, in Yemen over U.S. partners, because um, that's one of the things I talk about a lot in in the book and what I what I saw through the core conflict in Yemen is that um, there's actually there's some variation in, in the amounts of leverage that uh, the U.S. was willing to use that it did use. And there were several instances where um, it, on particular issues, it was able to use that leverage um, to good effect. So th there's an example, um, there's a, a story uh, cranes in Hodeida port that were damaged by um, coalition's airstrikes. So that really shut down economic activity in the port. Um, the I think it was uh, one of the international development organizations wanted to send replacement cranes. Uh, the Saudi coalition let them in and essentially um, some members of Congress got really interested in this issue from a humanitarian perspective and ultimately uh, I think it was the Trump administration that making 
uh, putting kind of, kind of specific leverage on Saudi Arabia or pressure on Saudi Arabia, it seems to allow these cranes into the port that they ultimately did. So I think there are specific instances that either that leverage has been really effective and then other times where they have um, not, not decided not to use that leverage or have tried different approaches that haven't been necessarily as successful in a civilian casualties. Um, yeah. So that's that's one thing. And the other part, uh, the the politics of protest around these conflicts in the in authoritarian regimes in particular is really complicated in the ways that um, you know these conflicts resonate with domestic publics and the way that those protests are seen as um, threatening by uh, authoritarian regimes is is I think helps to explain why you see kind of strong reactions to some things and not to other things. I think a lot of countries are also part of the Saudi-led coalition. So that's that's part of it. Um, Dana Al-Kurd is a, has done great work looking at um, protests and authoritarian regimes related to Palestine. So check, yeah. check her work. And then, you know, kind of relatedly, but from a different direction, which is, so we now know that we know from Hezbollah's own statements that Iran really was there at the beginning supporting them. And, you know, this was just a bunch of guys in the southern Beirut suburbs who got together and suddenly, you know, they killed 241 American servicemen in the Marine barracks. They attacked the U.S. Embassy um, and they got the Reagan administration to pull out of Lebanon. And now Iran, I mean, Hezbollah obviously is much stronger than the Lebanese military and to a large extent controls Lebanese politics. And it seems to me to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Iran. While we've already discussed the Houthis are much closer to Iran today than they were even, let's say, a decade ago. To what extent is Iran directing what they're doing or are they just doing what, you know, they, there's a so-called axis of resistance of which they're part of, um, which is, you know, sort of Iran is the godfather figure and the Houthis and Hezbollah and, Iraqi, Iran, Iranian-led militias in Iraq and Syria are all part of this. Are the Houthis pretty independent of Tehran? Are they? What? How would you um, characterize their relationship? Yeah, I think um, I see kind of Hezbollah and, and the Houthis and, and other members of the, of the um, axis of resistance along um, almost a spectrum. Where, as you said. For Hezbollah, Iran was very involved in formation from in shaping the organization itself, shaping its interests. It's also historically Iran has seen Hezbollah as being um, one of, if if not the most important members of that access in in, in terms of Iran's own security interests. Um, the Houthis are uh, kind of on on another part of the spectrum in the sense that they are more aligned or, or merged from very specific kind of localized issues. They, um, as you said earlier, are a variant of, of Shiism. Um, in, in some of them close to, to the Iranian regime, but it is still not the same um, doctrinally as practiced in Iran. Um, they, let's see, yeah, they, they emerged from in sort of the the 80s, 80s in response to Saudi proselytizing, Bobby proselytizing, and was very like a local revivalist, and um, all that is to say, kind of merged around very local, uh, in in the sense of local to to Yemen rather than maybe you know re international issues, um, and then because they found I think that they had similar interests and, and aspirations and. Um, with Iran and that there are ways that they could offer one another support that relationship um, started. It doesn't seem that, and it's hard to know for sure from kind of public reporting and, and the information that's available, sent to it that there was a relationship before the conflict, but it, it seems that before the war started, there was um, certainly a relationship, but maybe more maybe some resources by Iran, but more kind of diplomatically focused more about, oh, we have these interests in common, we'll support each other. Um, and that that relation really deepened over the course of the conflict in Yemen, as I think I think you said earlier. So um, the relationship has deepened. And then 
I think um, following October 7th, following Houthi um, involvement in firing uh, it directed at Israel, firing um, missiles and, and attacking ships in the Red Sea, they've been really one of the members of the axis of resistance that's kind of most out there um, in, in terms of, you know, international headlines. Um, and they have been able to use this um, series of events to demonstrate um, capability there and might be useful and important to Iran's. I imagine that that relationship has, um, if anything, has deepened and that um, Iran is increasingly seeing the Houthis as a relatively more important member of that axis of resistance. Historically, they were probably a less important member. Yeah. This is from David Sturman, who you know from New America. Uh, this final question, because we only have a few minutes left, which what moments, decisions would you identify as the times when the U.S. had the most opportunity to fundamentally change its policy in Yemen for the better? Okay, yeah, this is a tough question to answer in a few minutes. It's a really yeah. good one. <laughs> I'll try well, you wrote a book about it, so. <laughs> yes, I, yeah, for sure, <laughs> please, please read the book. Um, second, and I, yeah, I do really speak to, I think, a few moments where U.S. engaged, especially um during the post-Arab uh, Spring transition process, the U.S. And, and the international community were certainly engaged in that process itself, but I think could have been had a more sustained engagement um, after it had concluded and trying to actually move towards implementation, which never ultimately happened. There were, um, which meant that kind of none of those um, agreements that people ha had made were really implemented in practice, and then kind of petered out, and that gave space to the Houthis to. Um, take over the the capital Sana'a. Um, so I think that's an important moment. And then of course, I think the US decision to back the Saudi led coalition intervention in March, 2015 is a really big one too. And again, one I, I talk about a lot in, in the book. So that was kind of a key moment, but um, you know, following that there are a series of kind of subsequent moments where as, as we talked about um, the US, you know, could have used its leverage to affect, uh, argue to affect Gulf partners in different ways and, and sometimes chose to do so and sometimes chose not to do so or try to do something else. And I think maybe each of those moments is also uh, an important um, potential inflection point and also kind of uh, a place to learn lessons about um, the, the scope of, of US policy, what it can achieve. We ended right on time. Thank you very much, Dr. Stark. And thank you very much to the audience for uh, tuning in. And uh, if you want to buy the book, it's, a, uh, it's available for purchase at the bottom right of your screen. And we'd like to thank Alexandra Stark very much for uh, uh talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks for your support. It means a lot. Thank you.